Hello students, looking at current affairs for 11th June, the news items picked up from the Hindu newspaper are these 13, we we'll look at them in detail. The first one, three get life sentence for rape, murder of eight year old in Katwa. So this is the Katwa rape and murder case in which an eight year old girl from Bakarwal nomadic tribal community in this region in Jammu and Kashmir, she was gang raped by six, actually seven men have been accused, total eight. Eight people have been accused in this case. This was a 2018 case, and a special court in Pathan Court has now convicted six of the seven men accused in front of the court. The eighth person is actually uh, claim, claiming to be a juvenile, so the case is before the Jammu and Kashmir High Court on whether he is a juvenile or not. Then further you know, uh, prosecution would take place. So the mastermind of this case was Kanji Ram, a retired government official and priest of the temple where the crime took place. Also special police officer Deepak Khajuria and Kanji Ram's nephew, they, uh, they are the three main accused who have been sentenced to life imprisonment which the court says means they would be in jail till the end of their life. Also, the special public of police officer, head constable, and sub inspector, the three others have been awarded five years in prison for destroying evidence. So, police officials were involved here in destroying evidence. The court has acquitted the seventh accused, who is son of Kanjiram, giving him benefit of doubt. It is said he was uh, outside the uh, state for his examination. So, here you can see the District and Sessions Court here has concluded the hearing in record time of 14 months and the verdict was read out and the six accused were declared guilty under various sections of the law and the crime branch of the police as we discussed had to charge sheeted eight people. So one is a juvenile. That as I said is the Jammu and Kashmir High Court which will hear about the case, uh, the petition on determining the case. So you should know about this Bakrawal community here. The girl was kidnapped from Kathwa region and on 10th Jan and was found dead on 17th Jan. So it is said this abduction, rape and killing of the child was part of a carefully planned strategy to remove the minority nomadic community from the area. This is what the chart sheet also gives. So here you can see these are the three men accused who have been sentenced to life imprisonment. And this is regarding the Bakarwal community, a nomadic shepherd community in the Himalayan states, including especially in Jammu and Kashmir. They are nomadic community of shepherds. So they, so if they keep moving in search for pastures for their livestock. So they have settled and such and they live in this region in the lower plains during the winter. So this is the Bakarwal. The next is Supreme Court to hear plea by wife of scribe held for tweet on UP. So the Supreme Court has agreed to urgently hear petition by Jagdish Arora, who, by Jagdish Arora, who, whose husband Prashant Kanyojiya has actually been arrested by the MP police for allegedly uploading defamatory comments on social media against Chief Minister Yogi Adityanath. So a habeas corpus petition has been filed by her to know the whereabouts of her husband. So it is. Uh, the charges against her are it is claimed in the, under the repealed provisions of the Information Technology Act and Indian Penal Code. The police say they have evidence against him under section 500 and 505 of IPC and section 67 of IP Act. So we will see what is the, the section 67 of IP Act, Information Technology Act. So it is alleged that uh, Mr. Kanojia he shared a video on Twitter and Facebook in, a, in which a woman was uh, been speaking to reporters of various media organizations outside chief minister's office claiming that she had sent a marriage proposal to Mr. Adityanath. So this was the video which was shared. So Adityanath is actually the head priest of Goraknath temple in Gorakhpur. So also there have been other cases also, separate case in which on the same issue, another private news channel Nation Life, its uh, head Ishika Singh and its editor Anu Shukla were arrested in Noida for airing a debate over the same video following which UP police was met with widespread condemnation too. So now this is the case before the Supreme Court, a habeas corpus petition. So what is a habeas corpus petition you should know. These are, this is one of the five writ petitions under the, uh, under the constitution, under fundamental rights, right to constitutional remedies. 
so habeas corpus means he may have the body so a person when is uh, when a person is arrested he can move to the court or when a person is illegally detained in society so he can move to the supreme court directly to for the issue of habeas corpus so it is an order by a court to detaining authority to produce the arrested person before it so that it may examine whether the person has been de- detained lawfully or otherwise and if the court is convinced that the detention was uh, unlawful then it can issue order of release to him and section 67 of the it act under which uh, charges are framed this is an act uh, for on publishing or transmitting obscene material in electronic form so here you can see section 67 and section 67a is on regarding publishing and uh, publishing or transmitting sex- sexually explicit acts in electronic form and section this is section 67 section 66a of the information technology act has actually been struck by down by the supreme court what this act stated you can see is uh, you know power to ar- it gave power to arrest a person for posting allegedly offensive content on websites so this is offensive content not sexually explicit content so that uh, that uh, section 66a has been cut down or has been uh, struck down and is declared illegal by the supreme court still we see that many arrests take place by police officials from various states under this act so then is the entire timeline also how you know these people were illegally de- detained under this act like the first pil petition which was filed under this was uh, by law student shreya singhal who sought amendment uh, in section 66a because two girls were arrested in palghar in thane district because one of them posted a comment against shutdown of mumbai following shiv sena leader bal thakre's death and the other one liked it so on sharing this and other one liking it it was called obscene content and under section 66a these two girls were arrested this was 2012 case so since then they have even apex court has issued advisory in 2013 2015 supreme court uh, finally gave its judgment in which it struck down section 66a then next is girish karnad passes away in 81 at 81 so this is girish karnad writer playwright actor and public intellectual who passed away in his sleep in his rest of his residence in bengaluru he is a gnanpeet awardee and padma awardee he was one of the most prominent playwrights of the 1960s and 70s he's written plays his last play was rakshasa tangri so he's from bengaluru karnataka so this play also is uh, related to history so you should know about rakshasa tangri which was uh, set in, this is set in the last years of vijayanagar empire after which the vijayanagar empire came to an end he has also headed the film and television institute in pune nehru center in london and the sangeet natak academy too he is said to have often become the target of hindutva right wing his name was on the hit list of the right wing outfit that allegedly killed editor activist gauri lankesh in bengaluru so he had been provided security by the police too and uh, his uh, political activism it is said started from demolition of babri masjid but his first active involvement was over the baba budan giri issue in 2002 in karnataka so you should know about this baba budan giri issue too so this is uh, actually a shrine which sang parivar groups try to convert have been trying to convert into an exclusive hindu shrine so it's a shrine where both hindus and muslims visit so it was in 1975 when the karnataka state government decided to transfer this shrine from the muzrai department on the uh, to the waqf board so this resulted in uh, hindus claiming that it should not come under muslim and it was actually a muslim uh, uh, muslim leader uh, you know saint as such and this is a shrine of that saint but both hindus and muslims venerate him and visit the place So Hindu street is as abode abode of Dattatreya Swami, while Muslims condo, consider it place of the Dada Hayat Mir Kalam. So both take claim to it. So this is Baba Udan Giri issue. You should know about it. Also, he opposed the beef ban imposed by the government, and he his comments on Mysore ruler Tipu Sultan, even the celebration of Tipu Sultan Tipu Jayanti in Karnataka has been a cause of controversy. Uh, BJP leaders call him. as uh, an anti hindu ruler while he has he was a ruler in bengaluru in, in karnataka region so mysuru basically so he is revered over there but uh, tipu jayanti being celebrated has become controversy so here you can see this is regarding battle of talikota or battle, battle of rakshasa tangri as it is also called of 1555 
so here there were five sultans of deccan the deccan sultanate comprises uh, comprised of five regions so four of them participated in this except birar all others like you know uh, nizamabad bijapur bidar uh, and you know so all of them participated except uh, this bidar and golconda so these are the four sultans of delhi sultanate uh, of deccan sultanate who participated except birar so they fought against the vijayanagar empire so it was ram raya an old king of uh, vijayanagar empire who along with his two brothers fought the battle in this battle eventually ram raya was killed and uh, vijayanagar empire suffered heavy losses so this is the detail given to then next thing monsoon on coast goa issues safety advisory so with moderate to heavy rains expected to lash various parts of goa over the next few days now drishti marine which is a state appointed lifeguard agency of goa it has issued monsoon advisory instructing visitors not to venture into the sea goa government you should know it shut down beaches for swimming water sports activities from june to august every year so no swimming no water sports activities as the seas tend to become extremely extremely rough also state bans fishing for 61 days from june 1 to july 31 so that is also so these are some of the safety advisories which are important to even you know write some points for disaster management with respect to floods etc heavy rainfall so this you can look in the next thing modi to meet pre putin and at sco so this is shanghai cooperation organization the summit is to take place at bishkek in kyrgyzstan so prime minister narendra modi will be meeting russian president vladimir putin and chinese president xi jinping on the sidelines of the shanghai cooperation organization summit also whether meet would take place with pakistan prime minister is not yet confirmed or there's no indication of that and prime minister modi it is said he will also be uh, meeting uzbekistan president Uh, to hold bilateral discussion and he'll reiterate his invite to president xi to visit india for an informal summit later in 2019 last year in 2018 the first informal summit between india and china took place at wuhan in china also under shanghai cooperation organization india says it was satisfied with its participation in the rat that is regional anti terror structure of sco So India has been participating in tactical drills and counter-terror operations with other SCO members under that, which is headquartered at Tashkent in Uzbekistan. Also, you should know that India and Pakistan have joined the tactical military exercises under SCO's rats in August 2018, and they are recent members of SCO. SCO originally comprised of five. It was called Shanghai Five, formed in 1996, and then you know. Uh, Apart from China, the four countries were Russia, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan, with which China has borders. Then Uzbekistan joined it in 2001, and the group was no longer Shanghai Five; it came to be known as Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And this, you can see, India and Pakistan became its members in 2017, in June 2017. So under it, we have this RAT, Regional Anti-Terror Structure. Uh, so. and then there is the shanghai convention on combating terrorism separatism and extremism then next thing so this is again the rat shown here as one of the components of sco next is india may give pakistan its due for action against terror groups so a year after india was after pakistan was put under grey list by the financial action task force fatf India is now beginning to accept that Pakistan has taken some action against terror organizations on ground. So Indian officials say that Pakistani authorities have seized 771 seminaries, educational institutions run by Al-Ashkar-e-Toiba and its front Jamaat-ul Dawa and Falai Insaniyat and Jaish-e-Mohammed. So these have been seized by Pakistani authorities. It is said this is the first time since early 1990s that Pakistan is taking action against India focused terror groups. So it wants to avoid being put under the black list of fatf so that is why pakistan has taken action and india seems to be satisfied that that some action has been taken so it seems that you know ties between india and pakistan may be normalizing now so these actions you should know have been taken uh, and uh, pakistan was earlier also under grey list of fatf which was from the period 2012 to 2015 and now fatf will have its asia pacific group meeting in may 
and it is said that uh, the grouping has found that uh, Pakistan has taken inadequate action in 18 of the 27 areas which were highlighted. So this is the detail regarding SATF Financial Action Task Force. It has it can be seen as an international standard setter in fight against terror financing and money laundering. So these are two key areas in which it uh, sets standards. It was established in 1989 by G7, group of seven members, the G7 summit held in Paris. So the summit recognized the growing threat posed by money laundering to the banking system and financial institutions and set up the FATF to develop and promote national and international policies globally help eliminate this threat. So in 2001, FATF took over the responsibility for development of standards in fight against terror financing. So, so it was originally only money laundering and then it took up terror financing as such. So these are the two key areas and this is regarding how Pakistan has been put under the grey list by FATF. So the placement under grey list would hurt its economy as well as its international standing. Then next is 12 finance ministry officials forcibly retired. So, in sweeping action aimed at removing corrupt officials from service, President Ram Nath Govind forcibly ordered the retirement of 12 senior officials of Ministry of Finance. So, these are all of the rank of chief commissioners, principal commissioners and commissioners of income tax department as such. So, the complaints were there against these officials on corruption, extortion or acquisition of movable immovable property by them. So, assets by them, so which were not disclosed to proper authorities. Also, some had sexual harassment and illegal stopping the prom illegally stopping the promotion of colleagues, such charges against them. Also, some officials have been removed allegedly because they were uh, chronically ineffect ineffectual in their job, means inefficient. So, on such charges, you can see 12 of senior officials have been removed from Ministry of Finance. Also, they have been removed immediately rather than the choice of giving them three months notice. President removed them with immediate effect. Then next is Prime Minister seeks five-year roadmap for each ministry. So in the first meeting which Prime Minister Narendra Modi had with Secretaries of Government of India after his re-election, he has tasked each ministry with creating a five-year roadmap with well-defined targets. So there is also a need to propose a significant impactful decision in each ministry for which approvals have to be taken within 100 days. So this has been proposed. He has asked each ministry to focus on ease of living also. He added that India's progress in ease of doing business should reflect in greater facilitation for small businesses and entrepreneurs. Then next is Iran has accelerated uranium enrichment. So Iran has followed through the threat. It had said that it would opt out of the Iran nuclear deal or JCPO, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which it had signed with USA and European nations in EU and Russia being members too. So it has said that it would be opting out and it has because USA opted out of it and has threatened sanctions against Iran. So it has, uh, it has, it is said now it has, uh, Iran is accelerating its production of enriched uranium. So this is according to IAEA. International Atomic Energy Agency, which is UN Atomic Watchdog. So, uh, but then Germany's foreign minister was on a visit to Iran and he said that uh, Tehran will cooperate with EU signatories of the deal to save the deal. So, we will uh, try to avert the failure of the nuclear deal. So, this is the detail regarding the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. So, its objective was to make it possible for Iran to produce, make it impossible for Iran to produce a nuclear bomb while allowing it to develop nuclear power industry under the supervision of IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency. So, constraints on it were there, like cut in the number of centrifuges, etc. And in lieu of that, the economic sanctions were lifted against Iran. The signatories are mentioned here, you can see. So, this, these are the signatories you can see, Iran, US, Russia, China, France, UK, Germany, as well as European Union. And this was the timeline under the deal, but now US has opted out. You can see on May 8, 2018, US President announced withdrawal from the deal and re-establishment of sanctions. Otherwise, if the deal was uh, moving ahead on, on the pace as planned, it was a deal by USA under Barack Obama presidentship. So, US President Donald Trump opted out of it. The IAEA had, uh, had certified that uh, Iran has been following the restraints under the deal. Still, President Trump opted out. The next is government caution against rushing into electrical research. So, a day after industrial body 
that of uh, in, in the automobile industry, that is SIM and CII, the Confederation of Indian Industries, they called for a practical approach in formulating electric vehicle related policies. Now, two wheeler makers, Bajaj Auto and TVS Motors also have said that unrealistic and ill timed decision is taken by the government will derail auto manufacturing industry in the country. So, there are reports that government plans to ban sale of internal combustion engines, ICEs, in three wheelers by, by 2023 and uh, by, uh, and for uh, uh, two wheelers less than 150 cc by 2025 so it says that uh, none of the stakeholders currently possess any meaningful experience with respect to electric vehicles so this is an ill time decision the target is so close to uh, uh, bharat stage 6 implementation too so that is why concerns have been raised and it says why only two and three wheelers are being targeted cars are excluded this is an incomplete initiative the supporting infrastructure for charging also needs to be robust, as robust as conventional fuel options, the petrol pumps, you see, see. So only then such a policy can be put into effect. So that's what it is called, unrealistic and ill time. But this is just a report, no such decision has been taken so far. The next is, Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation proposes to use big data analytical tools to improve official statistics. So the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation has said that it proposes to set up a national data warehouse with a view to leverage big data analytical tools to further improve the quality of macroeconomic aggregates. So we have seen statistical data has been criticized, its quality and its authenticity has been questioned in recent times, especially with respect to employment related data too. So now these are the decisions taken by Ministry of Statistics. A national data warehouse will be established to use big data analytical tools to improve the quality of macroeconomic aggregates, the data. And also it says that a legislative framework would be evolved under which National Statistical Commission will function with independence and will give holistic guidelines to improve national statistical system. Also, the Ministry of Statistics says that the recent decision to merge Central Statistics Office and National Sample Survey Organization is aimed at leveraging the strength of the two organizations so that it can meet the increasing demands. So, it was NSSO uh, survey of on employment which showed that it was employment was at a 45-46 year high in present times. So that uh, report was leaked and then finally after the re-elections the report came in public domain. It was released by the government and NSSO has now been uh, uh, eliminated. So it's the merger of CSO and NSSO has, has been announced. So, so such criticisms uh, have been there on Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. Also revision of GDP estimates was done which showed that during demonetization time GDP was high. So first of all if GDP was so high it was improved. It was, uh, so how can it be high when it is not felt on the ground? So such criticisms came and the da statistical data was questioned. So this is the entire timeline, the history of uh, statistical system, its evolution in the country. So it was uh, a statistical unit initially set up in the cabinet secretariat in 1949, which evolved into central statistical organization in 1951. Then we had the national income committee appointed National Sample Survey Organization came into being in 1950. You should understand the difference between CSO and NSSO. Too. So, National Sample Survey Organization collects information through sample surveys on variety of socio-economic aspects. So, you will see the difference as such too here you can see. So, NSSO is sample based. It means it will arrive at results based on data of an available sample and CSO calculates national information. So, that is done on a nationwide census basis and it conducts economic surveys. So that's there. So you can see. Then finally, we had Department of Statistics, and eventually in 1999, a complete whole full fledged Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation established. And this is regarding the National Statistical Commission, too, which is uh, established to serve as nodal and empowered body for all core statistics related activities. So it ensures statistical coordination among different agencies and it monitors and enforces statistical priorities and standards. The next is banks can offer checkbooks for no frill accounts. So RBI has allowed banks to offer checkbook facility and other services to no frills account holders. But it said they cannot ask such account holders to maintain any minimum balance for such services. So basic savings bank account holders or no frill accounts, they have uh, it is designed as a savings account which will offer certain minimum facilities free of charge to the holders. So uh, if there are even uh, checkbooks to be offered, this can be done, but with no additional costs as such. 
so you know there are some minimum facilities which are provided for free, free presently by banks like minimum four withdrawals from atms in a month maximum deposit of cash at bank branch and atm card atm from debit card is also provided so now the question of offering checkbook facility is there so rbi said yes you can banks can offer but with no additional charge and they cannot be asked to maintain minimum balances there so even for no frills accounts we had a complete revolutionary financial inclusion program pradhan mantri jan dhan yojana uh, announced by the government then last news is coal india identifies assets in australia for acquisition so this is the public sector undertaking coal india limited it has identified assets in australia which it is keen to acquire equity in stake in so it is planning to appoint an internationally reputed merchant or investment banker to carry out the financial due diligence it has earmarked 6000 crore for the purpose too so earlier to also cil has acquired stakes like in africa it set up a company in mozambique it after it was granted prospecting license for two blocks here but then the operations have turned unviable now then it has also uh, joint formed a joint venture international coal ventures limited so this is a joint venture to scout for overseas properties which it formed with power psqs and two steel psqs and a mineral psq so all came together but it has also still failed to yield tangible results also coal india limited has its commercial uh, arm like uh, you know uh, an international arm called coal videsh so it's an arm of coal like how ongc has ongc videsh coal india limited has its arm coal videsh so you should know about icvl international coal ventures limited it's a consortium of coal india limited and as we said a power psq that is ntpc and two steel psq scale and rashtriya ispat nigam limited and mineral psq that is nmd it was formed in 2009 to buy coal assets for local steel units it acquired stakes in various countries you can see greenfield coal assets were also acquired this is that this icvl is a consortium of five psqs to hunt for coal assets over so these are the news items thank you